MP Angus is a rare individual who's bridged the worlds of music, the printed word, activism, politics, and public policy with good humor and an artist's perspective. Please give a warm welcome to Charlie Angus and Walter McDonough. Check. I'm in. Jimi Hendrix there. Um, there's a couple of uh, things I wanted to say before we begin. The first is I really want to thank Georgetown for putting my name all over the building. It really makes me feel at home. Um, you know, it's remarkable that this is our 10th anniversary. Uh, as someone who was here 10 years ago uh, on this campus, it's just incredible. I never thought that we would be here 10 years later, but then again, 10 years ago, I never thought the Red Sox could win the World Series. Um, I want to thank a lot of, of, of folks in the audience. Uh, I don't know if I see David Baskin here, but there's been, there's been a lot of people like David who've been with us from the very beginning, and we really, we really appreciate the support of the folks who come. We do this for you. It's a labor of love, but we just really appreciate all the great feedback that we've got from people over the years. I also wanted to thank the four great women who've led this organization, uh, Jenny and, and Ian and Jean and Lissa, We've been very, very fortunate to have such four strong women, uh, you know, run this organization. They've been great mentors, great friends, and, and they've really, uh, you know, um, really set the tone for what we do. And, and also, I want to thank um, Peter DeCola and Brian Zisk, uh, Michael Bracy, Kristen Thompson, uh, for you know, for this effort that we've been doing for 10 years. This journey we've been on together, it's just been quite a thing, and it, it just it's. The, the friendships that have been made in the last 10 years have really been exceptional. Um, when we started to conceptualize what we want to do on our, on our 10th anniversary, they said to me, um, you know, what would you like to do? And I said, well, you know, I'm really influenced by what Jenny Toomey set out when we started this organization, which is that, you know, there's a role for social activism in the arts. And for people who um, are involved in music or the visual arts who are able to use their cultural tools to help the less fortunate and be involved in social activism. And I couldn't think of a person who more typified that uh, than Charlie. Um, a man who was in punk bands and has done incredible community work in Canada and in the province of Ontario to the point now where he's uh, a highly respected and, and leader of the New Democratic Party in Canada but truly one of the great uh, politicians of our time. So, now that we've got all that out of the way, um, why don't you tell us where you're from? Well, uh, I, I, thanks, Walter, and I just want to say uh, what a thrill it is being here. I was in that session yesterday, and I was thinking, man, if I had gone to a session like that when I was 18, I never would have had to become a politician because maybe I actually would have made a little bit of money. Uh, I was like, all that checklist was killing me. Trademarks, man, that, that destroyed us. Band agreements, I mean, when your ex-singer leaves and then comes that back to, after you with a lawyer and, you know, you're just a bunch of punk kids wanting to have fun. Uh, I think what you guys are doing is really important. And as Walter says, though, you know, music at the end of the day, sure, it's great that you guys are tracking your metadata and you're making sure you're getting paid and that's artists should be getting paid but artists are there to inspire to change the world and that's that's why we're all here I mean that's why I quit school because I heard Joe Strummer and I thought there might be a better world out there that I just have to go find so me quickly I'm from uh, northern Canada I represent a riding that's what we call our regional electoral districts it's bigger than Great Britain it's got about 90,000 people it, uh, we have many communities with no roads. Um, I fly in bush planes into some of my isolated communities. Uh, it's solidly working class. Uh, I don't get elected on copyright back home. Um, we have the biggest gold mines, base metal mines, uh, uh, copper mines in the western world. Our, our men, 
travel around the world is the frontline miners in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, anything that ends in Stan, that's where people from my communities are out working in mining companies as frontline drillers. We have forestry companies. Uh, the far north of my region is uh, subarctic, isolated uh, First Nation communities. 40% of the people in my riding speak French as their language. Uh, the English are about 50%, but that's a, that's a Heinz 57 of every immigrant group from Europe that came to work in the mines, like my grandparents came. Uh, we probably have about 13% who their primary language is the Aboriginal language of, that's Cree. So uh, that's where I'm from, and uh, those are the people I love to represent. And so when, as a young person, you left Tim and Sudan in Toronto. Did you go to start a band, or did you just go to see what the big city was like? Well, uh, our family uh, were immigrant miners from Scotland. The Angus's, Charlie Angus, died at the Hollinger Mine, so I got his name. We aren't very original as Scottish people. We usually always get named after dead people, so Charlie was the last dead one, and so uh, I got him, and I probably got his politics. He was pretty hardcore working class from Dundee uh, with the very left-wing mining unions in those days. Uh, my mother's family are Cape Bretoners from no northern Canada, and uh, so I got my culture in that from them. But like all those immigrants, they wanted their kids to leave. They, they came and they worked in the mines and they wanted their kids to get an education and so the next generation went out. We moved to Toronto and um, that's when I discovered that, uh, you know, I just didn't like sitting still in school and paying attention and I still don't like sitting in uh, legislative committees for very long either. You'll probably notice I don't have a long attention span. So uh, music was it. Uh, Fifteen, I decided I was going to learn to play guitar and I was going to be gone at 18 and I was going to be on the road and everything would take care of itself after that but that's why we have the Future Music Coalition for all the people out there who've gone on the road at 18 and realized it's really great living on donuts and beer for about three years and then you've got to figure out what you're going to do with the rest of your life. But it, it's interesting in the past few years there's been sort of a resurgence in interest about um, the punk scene in Toronto in like the early 80s. And it's interesting because you got to play with the Dead Kennedys, for example. You got to play a lot of the famous bands, but also I think people are starting to remember some of the great Canadian bands of that period, like the Pointed Sticks, DOA. I don't know if anybody knows these bands, but it's, it's fascinating in that a lot of my Canadian friends, they're finding archival footage of all these bands. And it's kind of like, I think, other than maybe DOA, most of these bands didn't play in the United States. Most of them just played in, in, in British Columbia or Ontario or maybe in, in Quebec, but most of them never came down to the States. Well, this is the thing. We were, uh, there's a book that's been written about the history of Canada's punk scene, and we were called the original DIY band. But it was impossible to get out of your city. Uh, there were these pockets of music all over North America, and we'd hear about pockets of music. We'd hear about things in Boston and Vancouver. The idea of actually traveling and playing, it just was physically not possible. Not in Canada, probably till the late 80s early 90s and we didn't have the internet so for all of my record company lobbyists who are telling me that the internet is the greatest threat to music since uh, I don't know the phonograph or something it's like I was there back in the analog days and it sucked it sucked when you know you paid all this money to get a record to a record label and they say ooh weird punk stuff okay and then they never put it in a store and then you still owed the money at the end of the day so uh, I, I look at the younger acts and I'm, I think, man, if we were 18 again and we had that ability, there's bands I know that get started in Toronto and are playing in Madrid. Uh, you know, that's the upside. The downside is that nobody's making an income anymore. <laughs> that's why we're here. But the, the ability of artists to connect with each other and learn from each other. We knew about bands in Calgary. Someone might bring an album back. But the idea that we could actually travel across our own country and play, that didn't happen for a number of years until the scene started to change. If I remember the story correctly, and I don't want to date myself, but if I remember the story correctly, DOA was a Vancouver band, right? And they, and they became friends with a lot of the bands on the West Coast, like the Dead Kennedys and the Wipers and people like that. Do people, people even know these bands? At any rate, what they basically did was they asked them for phone numbers. And they would start calling around the United States. And one day my, phone, my friend got a phone call and said, hey, we have this band D away from Vancouver. Can you find us a place to play? So we said, yeah, we'll find. We know you guys. Are. We found them a place to play. It was awesome. But it was difficult. I mean, it, it, in some ways that, you know, historical period in some ways was very intimate because you got to meet everybody personally. But on the other hand, I just can't imagine how difficult it was for these bands to travel because 
it really was an ordeal for these guys. Well, and, and to get, it, get your sense of Canada, Canada is, you know, the second largest landmass in the world, but it's a very small population. Uh, and it's 12 hours between gigs across Western Canada. So if we are going to maintain a national music scene, uh, there needs to be basically a collective will to make it happen. If you're going to tour across Canada when, if your gig falls apart in Winnipeg and you're 24 hours of straight driving, that's your tour blown out. And it's the same in dance, it's the same in theater, uh, it's the same in all the arts. So there's been a sense in Canada all the way along. Now it didn't help the punk guys because they thought we weren't really arts. Uh, we thought we were, but, uh, but there's actually been a whole system within Canada to say, if we are going to be beside the largest entertainment juggernaut in the universe, we have to find a way to create a cultural space so that our artists can, can talk to each other, that we can build a national arts voice because we're strung out across a vast, vast terrain and most of our markets are extremely small. But at the same time though, it's got to be one of the great success stories the last 10 years has been the incredible uh, array of bands that have come out of Canada, whether it's the Arcade Fire or the Deers or Feist, it's unbelievable. I mean. Even compared to the United States and England, Canada has turned out some of the best music of the last five or six years. Well, it, it, yeah, the, the scene is, is always happening, but this goes back actually to a government policy, of strange, strange as it might seem. Uh, in the 1960s, you could not get a Canadian band played anywhere on any radio station in Canada. It did not exist. It was physically impossible because we basically got canned shit from L.A. and that's what we played. And we made a government decision at the time to say, we're going to insist that a certain percentage of radio is dedicated to Canadian bands. And we were, t you know, all the lobbyists said that's a disaster, you know, people are just going to hear crappy music. What it did was it created the seeds of an indigenous Canadian music scene that exists today. That is, that's our, probably one of our biggest international exports next to raw minerals is bands. We haven't been so successful hockey in some players. other areas, but yeah. You left out hockey players. Hockey players, yeah, but uh, we want all our hockey players to come home. We don't want them playing in Atlanta. I want them playing in Toronto, so I don't want those exports. But, uh, but these, it's happened year after year. We've managed to maintain a really cool indigenous music scene because we have, first of all, you could actually get your music played on the radio so bands got heard. Secondly, we had, we've established a number of funding programs to uh, build up. Uh, small record labels to uh, we have the factor program where you can go and I mean there I wasn't you know 23 we couldn't finish our record we got 1500 bucks from factor well 1500 bucks isn't a lot of money but it's the difference between making an album and not sometimes so there are there are grant programs two different sets because half a third of our market doesn't listen to the other th two thirds because a third of our market is French speaking only so we have a whole Quebec music scene that is vibrant, they got their star system, and there's a whole system in place to say, we as a nation want to make sure that we've got some voices. So it's been really, uh, it's, even, even our right-wing governments haven't messed too much with the funding programs for the arts. But, but let's um, talk about a few other things here. I mean, and so you're in Toronto, you're playing in a very successful band, and then you became interested in the issue of homelessness. Yeah, I was, uh, I was probably in my early 20s, I quit, I was a bass player for this band, Les Trangers. Um and then my wife and I started this Catholic Worker House. Catholic Worker is um, sort of a street, basically street home, taking in people off the street. And that's what I thought I'd do, and I was totally into it, and it was really exciting. And then I started the Grievous Angels just as a, um, just for fun, we were street busking, and the next thing I knew we were headlining the Regina Folk Festival, so that started my second music career. Um, I, we didn't mean to get a career out of it. We just meant to sort of blow off steam while working with the homeless, but I, I put a full band together and then we were back on the road for a number, another number of years. So at the same time, you're not only in a band, but you're also working in Toronto with a very vulnerable community. So. Well, uh, you know, music to me has never been separate from action. And it's funny, and this is where I'm going to do my political rant on why I'm a politician. You know, when we were in music, we were always political. And we were always doing political things. And people, like always the New Democratic Party, that's the party. I mean, they'd come and say, you know, we love your band. We want you to get involved in politics. Oh, man, we don't do politics. You know, we don't, like, we do, you know, street politics, but we don't do party politics. That's, and artists, English-speaking artists in Canada are really wary of big P politics. Whereas in Quebec, man, they're totally organized and they don't mind taking a government down on arts policy. But English Canada, oh, that's really not cool. And so you sort of sit back and you're touring and you're doing your thing and then you realize 
because you're not getting involved, they're electing idiots. And those idiots are turning your country into a dump. And that's, I mean, that's what we're seeing here in your own country. You know, like you might think all politicians are lazy, a lot of them are. You might think a lot of them are crooked, some of them are. You might think they're not very smart, very few of us are. But the people, they're sitting at the table making decisions about the future of your neighborhood, uh, your state, and your country. And so, to me, seeing what was happening on the streets of Toronto and seeing how government policies were p making people homeless, I started to think it was maybe we need to rethink this a little bit, maybe we need to get a little more active, and why can't we elect a punk rocker to politics? Why do we have just have to elect accountants? So I set out to get elected. You know, it's, I, we don't have a lot of time, and um, I did want to talk a little bit about some of your books uh, that, you, that, you've, uh, that you've written. Um, but I thought maybe what we should do is really sort of jump to the chase of, of what, one of the reasons why Charlie and I wanted to do this today, because we wanted to bring to light a couple of issues that um, that we, well, especially he does, but I also feel very strongly about, and we just wanted to use this as an opportunity to let people know about some of the things that, go, that are going on in his riding in northern Ontario. So, shall we, we begin? Are we going to do any digital copyright stuff? I don't stuff? know if we have enough time. I think we're running out of time. We only have ten minutes, right? All I'll right. do a quick one. We got, we got, I'll, I'll just do that and then we'll jump in. What do you want to do next? With the digital, with the well, I'll just, I'll just go right into it. Uh, you know, we never signed the, uh, the D Digital Millennium Copyright Act in Canada, and thank God we didn't. We learned a lot of lessons. Uh, we're trying to get a copyright legislation passed in Canada. I'm sort of the go-to guy. When I first got to politics, it was like, copyright, oh my God, it's really bad. Uh, we got to hide, or we, nobody wanted to deal with it. And, you know, it comes down to, like, we either have regressive copyright or progressive copyright. We either try and go back to 1998, and try doing that in anything else in the world, it ain't going to happen, or we try and look for 2018. So what, we've got a lot of debate going on in Canada about what copyright should be, but for the New Democratic Party, it should be about access and artists getting paid. You know, you can lock down all the content you want on the planet, that doesn't mean any artist is going to get paid, and you're just going to t create a criminal class out of people who enjoy your culture. So if we're going to move forward, and that's what we've been pushing forward in Parliament time and time again, is to say, let's get out of this dead-end model of saying content has to be locked down. Let's find a way to get a monetizing stream so that artists can actually get back doing what they want to do, which is create culture, and that's what it is. It's not product. It's culture at the end of the day. It's about talking to each other. It's about shared experience, and shared experience means people are accessing it and enjoying it, and you guys can actually feed your kids if you decide to have kids. And so that's, that's where we're coming from in terms of issues of net neutrality, issues of digital copyright issues in Canada. We keep going back. Where music is made, artists get paid, and fans should be able to access it. And all the rest is just detail. So that's, that's our copyright pitch. But it's, um, as, a, as a few scholars have pointed out, that Canada is almost like a copyright laboratory because you guys haven't been signatories to a lot of the international treaties. And now you're going through a, a big, big piece of revision that's somewhat similar to some of the things that we did in the United States in the 70s and the 90s. So it's, the world actually is looking at Canada right now. And some of the, there's been all kinds of proposals, like the, uh, the songwriters of Canada and Eddie Schwartz with their proposals for ISP levels. There's been a lot of fascinating ideas in Canada. But, um, all right. I can't say this word, my pronunciation is very poor, but could you tell us about the reservation in your writing? Okay, um, this is, this is really why I got into politics. The northern part of my riding, uh, First Nation, um, Aboriginal communities, uh, communities uh, called Attawapiskat, Kishetchewan, Fort Albany, Moose Factory. These are communities with no roads. We got thousands of kids. These are Canada's hoods. These are, these are the kids that are growing up uh, completely left behind. And in Canada, see, we do things a little nicer. It's just you don't see the horrific levels of poverty and systemic discrimination because it's out of sight, out of mind. And when I first flew up as an elected official into the James Bay region, and I said, holy God, like you've got 20 people living in a two-bedroom home, and your water, you've got to boil it for 15 minutes because it's got E. coli and, and it's, it comes out of the tap looking like red crap. And I said, when was the last time the last politician came up here? And he said, oh, he never comes up here. 
These are communities that have been completely written off the map of Canada. So one of my communities out of Wapiskat, this is why I'm, I'm driving, uh, I'm doing a lot of stuff with new media and, and awareness. We've been 30 years, their grade school is sitting on one of the most contaminated brown fields in Canada. 30 years. No plan to build a school. In 2000, the parents pulled their kids out of the school because the diesel fumes from underneath the school were making kids sick and they were passing out in the classrooms. And this is in the, one of the richest countries in the world. So they put these kids up in portables and then they just walked away. And we had, you know, we have a, the big guy who runs Indian Affairs is the minister, the Indian Affairs minister. We had four different ministers go to that community and make a pledge. We'll build you a school. Four different ministers walk away. So these kids, in my riding, the last time a minister walked away, these kids ran out and held a demonstration in their little reserve in minus 40 weather, 400 miles from the nearest road. And they sent me pictures. And I said... Say that again, though. I, I think you have to say it again. It was minus 40 degrees. They were f minus 40. Yeah, that's back home. That's, that's, that's summer. <laughs> they were standing out there, these little kids, five years old, with signs that they wrote on cardboard, asking for a school. And I thought... That is not going to go down on my watch. There's no way. So we started this. The kids started to organize, and we started to use YouTube and Facebook, and we, we decided that we were going to completely sidetrack the politicians. We were going to take this to kids across the country. And we started what became the largest youth-driven child right movement in Canadian history, where kids heard the story, they, they saw what was happening, we posted pictures. Man, we got access to information documents. The government was keeping track on me. They were keeping track on my kids were involved. We put everything online so kids could use it and they could start the campaigns. And that is the kind of work that I think is going to start to change the world. Is we've got to bring, like, our greatest resource are these little kids growing up in these isolated reserves. And we're either going to, like, consign them to another generation of jail and lost hope, or we're going to save these kids as dynamic, heroic, exciting, if we just reach out to them. That's what I do. And it's an isolated community to begin with because they're in the subarctic. Yeah. And folks have been living there for hundreds if not thousands of years. That's their culture. You know, I think we want people to live up there. And they've been abandoned by society to the point where their children don't have schools and the schools they have, they're in toxic dumps. It's, it's just, it's almost every time I read about this, it's, it's it's inconceivable to me that we could allow a, situ a situation like that with young people depriving of safety, health, and, and education. But why don't you tell us a little bit about Shannon? Uh, Shannon. Shannon uh, was this kid in 13 years old. And she started to organize the kids in this community. And they asked if they could come to Ottawa. And they had never left. You know, these kids, I mean, English is their second language, and they came down. And they were met by kids started coming from all over. Because so, so let's be clear, these are Cree. Cree, yeah. The Cree, Cree people. Yeah. Anyways, Shannon was this little kid with Moxie. And uh, she met the most powerful man in Canada and who looks over Indian Affairs Minister. He said, I'm too busy to build you a school. And she stood up to him and she basically showed him down and she became this national voice. Like people all across Canada heard about this kid who stood up and spoke up. And, and Shannon was just a, a little fireball. Anyways, one of the reasons we won the fight to get this school, we still haven't got the school yet, but one of the reasons we changed it was because we put faces to the situation. This wasn't politics, this wasn't bureaucrats. We made them confront the children directly, and it was the children speaking. And, and YouTube, uh, the videos we put up with the kids talking. So Shannon, she died last May in a car accident, and uh, the um, outpouring of grief when she died, like right across Canada, people were like, Holy God, this kid was on fire. How could she die? You know, we got kids killing themselves on reserves. And this little girl was like on fire. So we started this thing called Shannon's Dream. And what it is is that there's never going to be a kid in Canada who's never going to be able to have to go to fight for a school. We're going to make that change. So we've got this whole campaign. We've got unions are getting involved. We've got school boards. We've got people writing children's books. Because it's not just about winning the fight. It's about giving role models. It's about kids, in, whether you're in inner city Winnipeg or you're in an isolated reserve, you can say, one kid stood up and made a difference. Like, that is political change. That's where it really starts to happen. It's not some old guy like me standing up in the House of Commons taking on the Indian Affairs Ministers. It's saying, there's role models. There's kids doing that. And that's why I'm so excited about digital culture. 
because we can, it's the first time that they can confront the power in a way that they could never confront that power before. So I'm just, I'm on fire with this stuff. I think we've we got to change the world and musicians got to be the first to change the world because musicians are the ones who tell our stories. And that's, I know I'm preaching here, but that's the only reason I came. Walter said he was going to buy me a beer, and he actually hasn't so far. <laughs> but uh, so I had to just come and do my preaching. But but no, it's it's um, everyone that I know, the people that I've spoken to and told them the story, or told them about uh, these folks who live in Northern Ontario. It just blows people's mind. Like they can't comprehend how something like this could happen. But there's so many aspects of it that really resonate at such a human level. And and one of the things that we were talking about was the story. And I went to Columbia, which is, you know, so I've, I've spent a lot of time in Harlem growing up, and he told a story about a guy from Harlem named Ron who's oh, moved Ron. up. So why don't you tell a story about Ron? Yeah, Ron. Ron paid. He's a principal up in this com one of these communities. And Ron's about six foot eight. Ron was in, uh, I think Ron was in Desert Storm, or he was in Iraq, or he was, I don't know, he's, he's, been, he's been over there, and he's been in the Army. Anyways, Ron uh, was a high school dropout in Harlem. And uh, he went back to school, and anyways, he's up there with these kids. And he, he just became principal in this community, a moose factory, where we had 80 kids try and kill themselves over a course of a winter. How old were these kids? 13, 14, 80, 80 kids. Like the hopelessness. And anyways, Ron, I heard Ron on the radio one day, and like while these kids were killing themselves, the government was cutting funding for child welfare on the James Bay Coast because they were trying to save money. And these kids said to me one day, they said, yeah, we heard about that, uh, that uh, teacher who uh, got run over by a car in Toronto, and, or no, the, the teacher who killed himself in Toronto, and they, how they brought in all these grief counselors for the school. They said, we had 13 in our school over the last three months. Nobody ever sent us any grief counselors. And so Ron took over the school, and he was on the radio, and he said, they said, what are you doing, Ron? Uh, he said... I keep my school open at night. Any kid got a problem? I'm in the school, he says, because no kid is going to die on my watch. And Ron said to me before I came here, he said, you know, he said, we need contacts, Charlie. You know people. We could do really great things with these kids. He said, just give us the contacts and get our kids happening. Because these kids aren't hopeless losers. They've got pride. They've, they've got this amazing culture. They just need doors that open for them so they can go through those doors and become what they should be as opposed to what they've been consigned to. And, and speaking of the dignity of these kids, why don't you tell us a little bit about powwow culture? Yeah, powwow culture's uh, taken over First Nation territory big time and it's, it's really exciting. On the James Bay Coast where it's really isolated, their traditional dance music is fiddle. Fiddle and step dancing and, and it comes from when the first Scottish whalers were coming down in the 1600s. So the, if you see the old folks, the music that they would be listening to would be this crazy, used to be Scottish fiddling, but it goes at like 10 times the speed, and the step dancing is like almost wild style. But the young kids are picking up powwow culture, and powwow was South, South Amer you know, Southwest American culture, you know, from Na the Navajo and that. So it's not indigenous to Northern Canada. But about 10 years ago, we started to see the drummers coming in. And then the, the young girls started to get into the powwow dancing and the, the dress and the regalia. And the sense of pride that powwow culture is bringing in our communities is amazing. And, you know, for, for as dark as the stories I'm painting, there's phenomenal things happening in northern Canada with the resurgence of pride of, of kids who are starting to say, this is who I'm from, and being part of, like, in our, in, our, in our communities now, you know, in the non-native communities, there's a sense of growing pride in their culture too. And, and cultures are starting to work together based around this, this assertion of, you know what, we are, the, we are the first peoples of Canada. So I always thought it was funny, natives and uh, your Native Americans here, right, they, they were just Indians, they just didn't know they were Americans until you guys came and told them. But in Canada, we call them First Nations. It's like, they were there first as their own nation, which is actually in French means people. They were their own peoples and they're still their own peoples. And, you know, we're going to live together for the next two or three or four hundred years and we're going to continue to grow together and it might be great or it could, we could fight, but we're still going to be growing together. So powwow culture, I've been really, I, I go to all the powwows and, uh, and, and watch these, the, the sense of pride that's coming in the communities and the pride of the region because of it. Does anybody have any questions or anything like to add from the audience? Sure, Peter.
what music can actually do. You know, how it can affect commerce, how it can affect people. And it just, it just blows my mind that we have such opportunity in this room. How can we possibly reach out to these kids? Well, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that. Um, you know, when um, we were thinking about, you know, what we wanted to do with the 10th anniversary, this is what I wanted to do. Because, I mean, I can talk about music and copyright to the cows come home, but I really wanted to use this as an opportunity to let all of you people be aware of what's going on. And, um, you know, I, has anybody ever seen a movie called Requiem for a Dream? It's like the most depressing movie of all time. And, and, and the whole point of the movie is it's the abandonment of hope. And, you know, I just have a problem with that because I think that we, we can't give up hope. But I think that, you know, there's two things that we can do. And I think the first thing we can do is we can find ways of supporting things like Shannon's Dream. It doesn't take a lot of money. You can send them $5, you can send them $10, but I think that if we try to do some sort of financial help with these people, it's going to go a long way. The other thing that I think is really important, and this is a room of very talented people, people who are attorneys and musicians and technology people, um, all of us have something unique to offer. And, and I think there's some way amongst all of us who are here today, who attend the conference this week, I think there's some way that we might be able to set up some sort of link with these kids over the internet. Maybe like once a week one of us could talk to the kids, share our experiences about music or culture or whatever, but just to let uh, the children and the teenagers in that community know that people like us are thinking about them and we want to help them and we want to use the, the 10th anniversary of the Future of Music Coalition to really try to build something to help these kids in Northern Ontario. I, I, I couldn't agree with you. I think this gentleman wanted to add something. Uh, my name is Stefan Saeed. I, two weeks ago, I, at the, I headlined the you know, uh, Millennium Development Goals Awards, and, the, and in the last this month and a half, there's just been a flood of support that where a bunch of teams of international development pros joined with me and, and, uh, and folks from several interfaith, global youth action networks, so forth, to launch a website called different.org, which is a clearinghouse now. We're building like a one-stop for music for social change. And one of the main things that we're bringing together, you know, there's staff now already all over the world that's just populating the site, and if you all know about it, but to create a place where, hey, it, it can be hip-hop, folk, rock, rap, punk country, so we create a movement in the sense that's like what Hank and, and Jill and everybody were talking about, where we don't, we haven't been able to, in part because of the genreification of music, to create a generational movement, like maybe you had in the 60s, you had James Brown next to Bob Dylan and whatever on the same station, right? But it, one of the major things that we're doing right now, and this is working with like, over 30, 40 mayors for peace in major cities around the world with the United Nations uh, World Conference of Religions for Peace to work and cre create a curriculum to get youth around the world creating their own music and videos for social change so that they can upload them to a single platform where they can actually be heard. Because the most important thing that we could really do for them and that they also would want to do, I mean, so I'm just telling you, I'll happily feature this on the site so we can talk afterwards. 
but you know, and FMC has always been about, this is totally what net neutrality is about. If there's one thing that we have to really, why we want to protect net neutrality, it's because we need to elevate the voices of a global majority right now that's not being heard, that knows that we need a major shift. Right. And um, so I just want to tell you about that, but also just say let's talk afterwards. Great, thank you. But again, for your work. again, just to conclude, I mean, you know, 10 years of doing this, and there's been a lot of different things we've been involved in. And, you know, social activism could be a conservative thing, it could be a liberal thing, it could be a Democrat or Republican thing, it could be in anything if you believe in something where you can help people. And fundamentally, as someone who's really studied this a lot, we can help these people. This is not impossible. This is something we can do. We can actually help these people, all of us. Well, I, I, I know we've got to move on, and, and you guys got a lot of stuff. One thing I just want to say is that it, it was the mashup culture. It was the access to technology that made these kids go from being hopeless to, to have hope because they plugged into a wider world and we're plugging into that world. And that, you know, that's the potential of digital culture, that you can take communities where there's no roads and those can, communities can take on the man because they can get their story out there. Charlie, if we can keep building, that's where we're going to go for a new world. Charlie, thank you for coming. Thank you so much.